Good morning, how are you, Pam? And good morning, everybody else, too. It's good, each, each week it seems like we get a little bit more full in here, I like that. Also, welcome to those of you online. Got to do a better job at talking to, talking to you. <clears throat> well, how many of you were here maybe three or four weeks ago when we were talking about prophecy? And, okay, 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 but not everybody. Well, we were talking about prophecy, and I told a story of, I think it was my first night in youth ministry, and we had this prophetic type teacher guys, guest speaker show up, and at one point he was going around the room and prophesying whoever wanted to be prophesied. Well, Pastor Reagan said, everybody stand up, and because he wanted us all to get the prophecy. Well, the guy prophesied a couple people. He got to me and he said, um, it, Isaiah 54 talks about your tent stakes being, being widened, and, and the Lord's doing that with you. He's increasing, he, you know, it's stretching, but it's increasing your capacity. And uh, so then the guy asked me, are you thinking about starting a new ministry? And I'm like, well, tonight's my first night in youth ministry. So he was like, there you go. He, he prophesied over a couple more people. And then he came back to me and he said, this, this next year is going to be a hard year for you. And, and then that's about all he said. And then he moved on. I liked the first prophecy better than the second one, obviously. <laughs> But it turned out less than a month later, my, my sister got in a car accident and died. So she's 33. I was 30 at the time. And that last, and that, the year, just like that guy prophesied, that next year was, I would say, a very hard year. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's obvious, so don't overthink it. Why was that next year a hard year? Grieve, yes, because I was grieving. It's when someone you love dies, it's natural to grieve. I, I, I think we would all agree on that. I remember going to church one Sunday, and somebody, one of my friends, asked me, "Well, how you doing?" And I said, "Well, actually, things are a little foggy. Not too long after my sister had passed away." Uh, I told him things are a little bit foggy and, and I'm kind of off my game. I'm a little bit grumpy. And he told me, well, that's because you lack faith in God. <laughs> he said, if you had faith in God, you wouldn't be grumpy because God's in control and he knew it was going to happen. Now, I tell you that because that is not the way to respond to somebody <laughs> that pours their heart out to you while they're in grief. Uh, you know, it's best just to listen and tell them you're so sorry that that happened. Anyway, that's what I've, I've learned. Well, for the next few weeks, what we're going to talk about are different interruptions that happen in our life. Actually, what we're going to be talking about is grief. But I thought if I told you we were going to start a series talking about grief and sorrow, no one would show up. <laughs> so, so we named we call in this interruptions. A lot of times in life, stuff like that happens. We get interrupted and, and loss occurs and, and then sorrow happens. Probably most, yeah, most times that I get the honor of celebrating the, the life of someone at their memorial service, I'll use the same passage of scripture. So if you've been at one of my funerals, you probably heard me read this very passage of scripture. And, uh, you know, unless the family gives me another one and says, we want you to use this one, then I'll use that one. And, and this is the passage of scripture that I believe the Lord has for us today. And it comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I'm reading verses 1 through 3. It says, a good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. 
Lord Jesus, you have something for each one of us that are listening to this message, and I pray that our hearts would be open to receive what you have for us, Holy Spirit. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's say I read that, did you get it? Did you get, really, did you believe it? Do you believe what I, what I just read? Because it says the day of death is better than the day of birth. Better to go to a funeral, it says, than to go to a party. Now, I'm just curious. How many of you would rather go to a funeral than a party? Funeral? Nobody. How many of you would rather go to a party than a funeral? Yes, much more. And then it says uh, sorrow is better than laughter. How many of you would rather be sad than happy? Okay, how many of you say, I'd rather be happy than sad? Well, me too. So I read this passage of scripture, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? But it tells us right there, it says, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. Now, there are certainly people that have gone through a terrible situation, and they have been sad, but they have not got better. You know somebody like that. Uh, if you're sitting by him, don't look at him. Just look at me. Keep your eyes forward. <laughs> but this passage of scripture that was written by King Solomon, who is said to be the wisest man that has ever lived, it says that we can actually get better. That when we go through these interruptions in life or we go through these these losses that we take along the way and we and and then sorrow follows those losses and we grieve the the loss this passage of scripture says that actually our heart is going to be made better and obviously that's not the organ the heart that but but that our who we are our our character who we are is going to be better guys this this is i'm discipling you this morning as Christians, we're going to be learning today and for the weeks to come what it means to go through life and have those interruptions happen and how it is that we're supposed to respond. And we can actually, this passage of scripture says that we can actually grow, we can actually be a better person if we, if we go through these correctly. So sorrow can mature us. At the, at the heart level, at the very core of who we are. Now, as I told you, I use this passage of scripture when, I'm, when I do a celebration of life. And uh, because it's normal for us to have sorrow. And of course, I'm talking to the people that are still alive. And I want to help them know how to navigate through this next season. But my question for you, and once again, it's obvious... But do we only grieve when somebody close to us that we love dies? No, of course not. I've known people that have gone through a divorce and they are just devastated. Or somebody violates another person, they, of course they're devastated. Or if you get be betrayed by a friend, that, that's just something that you go through that you end up being sorrowful, and you grieve that. So sorrow can happen uh, more than just the death of a loved one. Sorrow occurs when we experience loss. I've had people that, as their pastor, I've given them the best years of my life. I've grown them up. I poured into them. And then they leave and go to another church. Well, they don't die, but I still grieve them. I grieve, I, I grieve the loss of them being around here. And I didn't even... I still see them at the store and we hug each other and, and that type of thing. We're still, I didn't lose the relationship, but I still grieve, grieve that loss. My oldest daughter moved back to Yakima, so now I have all six of my grandkids living in Yakima. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was driving the... The, my grandkids around, a couple of them around, the oldest ones, and they were talking about how they were sad because, you know, what about the friends they're moving away from? And what about, what about they were sad because that was the house they, they grew up in? I, they, they were sad because of the school that they weren't going to get to go to the school. Now, I can see the friends, the loss of those relationships with the friends, but can you grieve a house? I mean, isn't that like wood and 
brick and concrete? Sure, you can, you can grieve a house. I, I, was, I was thinking, and if you've had children, I would imagine you did this too. You know, you, 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 this, this baby's grown inside of mom and, you know, and, things, you know and, you're, and you have dreams for this child. And then, and then they're born and somewhere along life, you come to the realization that is not going to happen. That is just not who they are, right? Oh, I'm the only one that did that, yeah. <laughs> so then you grieve the loss of this dream or expectation that you probably never should have put on them in the first place. But you come to the realization that day that's not going to happen and you end, up, you end up grieving the loss of that. But if we go through, and there's many different types of interruptions, many different types of things that we grieve through in the course of our life. But if we go through those correctly, guys, we can actually be better people. We can be better at our heart. Our heart is made better. And conversely, losses that are not grieved accumulate in our soul like heavy stones that weigh us down. <laughs> and I was in ninth grade, we lived in Wenatchee at the time, and in school there was this class, it was called uh, Outdoor Ed or Outdoor School or something like that. Anyway, in the spring, we got to pack in, you know, everybody had this backpack and we made this pup tent out of Visqueen and we packed all our food together in the backpack, the bus took us up in the mountain somewhere, we hiked in, I don't know how far it is, let's say it was five miles. We hiked in five miles to this campsite and, and, and then we got to spend the night, imagine about 30 ninth graders and it seemed like there were two adults or something up in the mountains. <laughs> you know, so we set up our camp and cooked dinner and, and then we slept and got up the next morning, cooked our breakfast, packed our backpacks up and, and then went back down and met at the bus when we were supposed to meet at the bus. Well, I remember getting to the bus and some of the girls were like, man, that was harder packing out than it was packing in. And some other people will say, yeah, but we didn't get a very good night's sleep last night. Well, anyway, one of the girls got into the top of her backpack to get something. Well, she starts pulling out these river rocks. <laughs> <laughs> they had left their backpacks un unguarded for a while, and some of the guys, I don't know who they were, they put these river rocks in the girl's backpack. So those girls were packing out with 10 or 15 extra pounds that they had going in with. That was so funny. So, but losses that are not grieved accumulate in our souls like heavy stones. Not rocks in the backpack, but still, imagine, you know, quite similar. Imagine going through life, carrying around all these river rocks that you're not supposed to be carrying around. So listen to this, see if you agree. Few people understand loss and grief. You may agree with that, I... You may not agree with that, but, but I want you to think about that for a moment. Few people understand loss and grief. How do you, are you good, are you good at uh, stopping and grieving? Just think about, I mean, the last couple of years, all the things that we have, that we have lost during the COVID-19 thing, we, the, you, of course, the lives that have been lost uh, because of covid but then, you know, just that we weren't able to go into the hospital or weren't able to go into the assisted care facility and, and visit our, our relatives like we normally could. Or imagine if you were a senior in high school. I would, I would be devastated if my senior year in high school I didn't get to play football. That would have just, you know, and the graduation, they didn't get to walk with the graduation. They stood in their front yard in cap and gown and people drove their car by and honked their horn. That, that didn't seem, I participated in a couple of 
drive-by birthday parties. I didn't participate real well. I should have gave the kid a present. I didn't know it was my first drive-by <laughs> birthday party. How was I to know that? <clears throat> but really, really, we lost our freedom. You know, we weren't able to congregate gather together as the Bible tells us to and, and have church the same way that you couldn't go to the movie or some of the stores were closed, you couldn't go shopping and that type of thing. Some, I think sometimes we think that if, if, we, if we were to stop and, and feel that sorrow that somehow that's going to slow us down, that's going to hinder us from moving on. So sometimes I think we try to pass through. Really, grief is what we're trying to pass through. We're trying to get on the other side of that just as quickly as possible. I remember when, before my fourth grade, my parents moved us from Salem, Oregon, down to Winslow, Arizona. And so we were in Winslow, Arizona, moving into this house. And somebody had left the front door open and then left the gate, the front gate open. So my little dog, Skipper, ran right out the front door, right out the gate, right under a tire, squished, dead. Oh, man, I was heartbroken. I was just crying uncontrollably, and there were people there. Help. So I look back on that. You know, is that the right thing to do? I stopped crying. <laughs> but, but I don't, I wonder, and... You know, my mom, and I'm sure my dad was in on it too. They were doing the best that they knew. They were doing what they were taught to do. So uh, nothing against them. But I wonder if they could have helped me go through that a little bit better and, and learn what I was supposed to learn as I grieved the loss of Skipper. Instead of, you know what I learned? When you lose something, get another one just as fast as you can. <laughs> Which, it, which isn't the, it's, it's not a great thing to just hop right back into a, 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 you know, another marriage if you just ended one. That's not, I know, I know that's not the right thing to do. And, and I think, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about how my parents raised us in that, in that particular way. And usually when this idea of sorrow that, we have interruptions in life, so we have losses in life that create sorrow. In the Lawson family, when I was raised, if you, if you were experiencing sorrow, if you were sad, you'd get sent to your room. You go to your room until you can put a smile on that face. So we learned pretty quickly in our house that, that sorrow was unacceptable. And I read... I was reading, a, recently I was reading a resource and it was talking about millennials are a lot better at helping their children um, identify their feelings. And um, they're, they're, the millennials have been doing a great job of helping their kids express, you know, talk about those feelings where the millennials need work are helping the, the kids uh, correctly respond to those feelings. So, you know, you're sad. Why are you sad? Well, we just lost the soccer game. You know, that, um, okay, that's good. You're sad because you lost the soccer game. So, but then we're, we need to take it one step further and say, okay, what can we do? What can we do so that we don't lose the soccer game next time? I, this particular resource, that's what it was saying. You know, quit which certainly is an option. You'll never lose an ever soccer game the rest of your life. Um, but, you know, how about work harder? You know, that type of thing. So, I want us to just have a moment here. When, when loss enters your life, how do you deal with that life? Or how do you deal with that loss? Do you... Do you try to minimize it? Or you try to deny it? You know, it's only a dog. Skipper's only a dog. Or, or maybe you try to numb, you know, or distract yourself from it. Uh, more work or, or movies or drugs, alcohol, sexual type stuff. 
uh, overeating, uh, you know, sh shopping therapy, that type of stuff. Is that when loss enters your life, do you try to escape that sorrow by doing those things? Or maybe do you blame other people when you're experiencing loss? Well, it's my husband's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my kid's fault. It's my parents' fault. <clears throat> Here's another thought for us. I mean, we're in church. Does your theology allow room for what some author calls the, the dark night of the soul? Does who you think God is, does he even allow you to be sorrowful? I think sometimes we fail to realize that uh, a refusal to embrace our sorrow and to grieve them fully condemns us to a shallow spirituality that blocks the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And we'll unpack this a little bit more next week. But you might be thinking, well, Pastor Tom, you can't, you can't prove that if I, don't, if I refuse, if I try to cover up my sorrow, that that's going to cause me to be more shallow spiritually. But yeah, I can. Because when we deny, when we deny the loss and the sorrow, we're denying the way God created us. He created us to have feelings, and, and some of those feelings come in the area of loss. And so this will if, we, if our theology is that God doesn't allow us, you know, like my parents raised me, you go to your room until you get happy. You know, God's telling us, you just, go, you just go be by yourself until you can put a smile on your face. What happens is we have a superficial then relationship with God because we can't, we can't express some of the things that we really are. And not, I mean, I would imagine nobody likes to pain, right? We all like ease and comfort. So why in the world would we move toward the pain? Why would we spend time moving toward sorrow and processing it? Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, because it's by sad countenance, the heart is made better. So in conclusion, what I want to do so I'm going to read our text again today, but I skipped, I skipped purposely the fourth verse, and this time I'm going to read it to us again. It says, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. Now, there might be some sitting here saying, okay, sissy boy, you want us to come to church and talk about our feelings for the next three weeks? I'm just not going to do it. If you're anywhere close to thinking along that line, I really want you to listen to this next verse. Verse 4 says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Or the heart of fools is, you know, trying to just party. So if you don't, if you don't trust me as your pastor, trying to disciple us, trying to help us be better per people and learn how it is that we deal with loss in our life, if you don't trust me, at least trust King Solomon. That, and that he was inspired by God to write this down for us and that we can actually get better at the core. If we come participate the next few weeks and process how it is that we grieve correctly according to the Bible, then we can be better people. Actually, we can be wise people. And, and um, and it's a foolish person that continues to mask the pain, continues to run from the pain, continues to try to go to the house of mirth, what this is saying, or to continue to party sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and just kind of Netflix and Hulu and Apple TV marathons to, to kind of get away from 
the, the pain of sorrow. Well, I'm praying for all of us that we will, we will be wise and we will spend the time and participate in this series and learn how it is that God wants us to grieve so that we can be better at our hearts. If, if you think that's a good idea, say amen. amen. And if you don't, you just get out of here right now. <laughs> Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I want to I wanna be more like you. And... And so I continue to read your word. I continue to listen to the Holy Spirit. And you continue to form my heart to be like the heart of Jesus. Lord, I pray that for all the people that call this their home church. That we are all trying to have the heart of Jesus. And I think you're asking us to talk about grief for a while around here. So I'm being obedient to you. And I pray for all of us that we will push in. We'll push in and we'll learn what it is that you want us to know so that our heart will be made better. That the, the character of who we are, the, um, the person that we are at our core will be made better. We open ourselves up to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand with me, please. There'll be people up front here that want to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, I encourage you to come forward and get prayed for. I want to, uh, seems like I'm missing one more thing, but I can't think of what it is. So I'll send you an email. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And he'll lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you shalom, shalom. God bless you. We'll see you next week.